I've got to say, I've been really amazed with the um, awesome quality of speakers. Normally when we go to conferences, it's a lot of reading from PowerPoints <laughs> verbatim, which it's a shame we see these at educational conferences, but we do see them. So I actually thought, to be unique, I should have actually got the PowerPoint that I could have read verbatim on. That would have actually been a point of difference. So I'm happy that's not the case this time. So what I came here for was to tell you that I love surfing. All right. Hopefully you can see by that picture. What relevance that has to my topic, I don't know. I just wanted some feel-good photos to, um, to start the session. I can also use the clicker. Oh, yeah, this is really just compounding the fact that I love surfing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a stock photo. Like, I'm not that good at surfing, but I love it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so what I want to ask you is, what do you love? And I know this goes against Laurie's theory of the current view and better view, but think of the future self of you right now. Sorry, buddy. Um, and think about what you'd rather be doing right now. Really sorry, buddy. Um, and, and if being in the current place that you're in is, is where you'd rather be, then your current view equals your better view. And I'm just going to ad-lib here, but that's a good place to be, right? Yeah, good. All right, I've got the nod up. So think about what makes you happy, just anything. Think of three things that just make you happy. You don't have to share them so you can be totally honest and I'll sort out this microphone so I can have a free hand. I was actually gonna get you to rap. Um, it was a recommendation by someone earlier on. All right. I feel like a robot now. It's like backup against backup. <laughs> My background is a project manager so it's all about inbuilding redundancy. So this is um, case in point right there. Okay. Anyone want to share? Sure, really. I was expecting no. This is personal <laughs> stuff. You said we didn't need to share. But anyway, all right. travel. You love to travel. So your mind is probably thinking about holiday destinations other than Parramatta? Well, hopefully. Yeah, I don't know. I'm from Perth, so this is super exciting to me. So I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> like, Parramatta, best place ever. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I did some research, um, and, and I did this activity before, so it's me being prepared. Um, I love spending time with my wife. She's, she's wicked. She's awesome. So other things I love to do, spend time with my wife. Best thing ever. Got a little boy. He's, he's four. He's awesome. Other things that my mind goes to. Yeah. You're setting a trend here. My little girl, she's awesome. Um, yeah, I'm actually trying to turn her into a boy, as you can probably see by this, but <laughs> this is where my mind goes when I want to be happy. So th then I worked out the best point was combining the two. It was combining, not the boy and the girl, that's just ridiculous. Um, it was combining my love of surfing with my love of my kids, so I take them surfing. So this is what I reach as my pinnacle of, of awesomeness for me. That's, that's what I think about where I want to be. Cool. And for me, this is how I'm actually measuring success. The more time I can spend there, the better off my life is. Right? That's my metric. You've got your own, which is your happy place. Right? It wasn't always like this. And I used to measure success very differently. So when you leave school, you get told, get a job because you need to be successful, right? No one gives you the picture of success as this. You get this picture painted. Success is spending a lot of time in an office, with people you may or may not love, I don't know. Um, I don't know your situations, I'm not going to go into that. Um, spending a lot of time at a cubicle, like everyone else, to get money to pay for a house that you probably can't spend time to live in, to pay for the car that you can't afford to drive. You know, but you're being successful by every literal definition of success. That's it, that's the picture we get handed to us. For me, it wasn't the case, but I found myself starting here. I was doing long hours. And the more successful I got, the longer the hours became. So I was like, yes, I must be successful because I'm working even longer hours. I'm spending time being this dude in the picture. This is good. Then it sort of broke and I was like, well, hang on. Maybe I'm different. Maybe my values aren't reflected in this sort of situation. So I went back to my ideals and I was like, well, hang on. For me, I want time. So the genius inside my brain... Laurie says you have three brains. I've, I've got one that rarely functions. But at this point, it said, hang on, how's a way that you can get more time? And I was currently managing projects, and there were 10 to 12-hour days. And 
it was fun. I'm not saying I was dispassionate about what I was doing, but I was dispassionate about the hours I had to do. So I got offered a job in training, which is how I accidentally fell into the training profession. This is a funny story because I had a massive fear of public speaking. I exited every uni subject that had a public speaking component. So when they offered me this gig, I was like, are you on glue? Like, why would I want to put myself <laughs> in front of people and talk? And they said, here's a clincher. You get paid for it. All right? And I was like, you get paid for it. That sounds good. And at the time, I was getting $70 an hour for doing training. And I was just getting time and lieu from other jobs. So I thought, this is awesome. It's like I've replicated myself. It's like dual income stream. Subsequently, I fell in love with training. All right, so I can't stick at something I don't love. And I fell in love with training. I was like, you're giving people value. You're giving people benefits. And the benefit was to me that I was getting a reduction in my time. This story will have a point. But before it does, then the other genius brain said, why don't you do this as a business? Because that's what grown-ups do. Then you can get even more time off. Yeah, you know where this is heading, right? <laughs> you can just be your own boss. And being your own boss just sounds super sexy. You can get other people to do the work. And, you know, because you still love training, you can do bits and pieces of the work yourself. Kick ass. On to a winner. What do you think happened? Yeah, so I went, did some training, did some business stuff, because who knew? <laughs> they don't tell you this at school. Running a business has lots of other stuff. Yeah, you nearly dropped the F-bombs. I was going to go with it, but... Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff associated with it. So I found myself doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this, and I was probably going back and forth and being really dizzy. But effectively, I wound up being in the original position to which I started. And I was like, hang on, that was not the idea. All right. Clearly, I have no actual strategic plan to my life, and I just wing it, and in this case, it backfired. So I thought, look, what do I need to do? Go, go back to the whiteboard, go back to the drawing board, and come up with a new model because the original model of success really wasn't working for me. So, me going back to the whiteboard. Started questioning things, started questioning life, started questioning being this guy. Is anyone this guy? Figuratively, like literally you're not this guy because I stole a stock photo, but figuratively, are you this dude? He's successful, you can tell by his attire. He's busy, you can tell by the amount of stuff they position in this, in this photo. Do you want to be this guy? No, no, most of you are far better looking to be this guy. But what this guy does, and, and I was this guy, not as handsome as this guy, not as well dressed, but effectively I was this guy. I was so busy. I was doing everything. I was controlling everything. I couldn't sleep. I had current state, future state, this state, what's someone else going to do whilst I'm away state going on? I was busy. People were actually taking hold of my calendar. They were booking events for me. I didn't control my life anymore. Not a good place. I had this thing called a to-do list, and I know it's not a, a breaking concept, but my to-do list was full of stuff that I didn't want to do. And then all the cool shit that I wanted to do never actually got done on my to-do list because I was putting out fires. I was doing all this other stuff. I'm getting some nods. So I'm getting people that can relate to, to that person. So maybe there's more of that guy than, than I thought there were. Yeah, you've got staff, right? Because you thought, I can fix this problem by getting other people to do stuff I don't want to do from my to-do list. They're happy. They're having a good time. They go home, they have beers. You go home and you worry because it never leaves you. So this is talking about managing growth. And if it's managed poorly, you end up in this situation where you're that guy. You're worrying all the time. And any issues that you had get magnified exponentially as your business grows. In, sight, in hindsight, having a small business would have actually made more sense, would have had more time to myself. But I guess the bad side of doing a good job is people want you more, and they want you more. And service, which is what training is, being an intangible you know, aspect or product, it's an oxymoron, but whatever, um, is such that people can't touch it, they can't feel it, and a lot of it is based on the vibe. Look, Nick, I want you to do this presentation. And I'm like, but I've got this guy. Look, he's happy. He's so much better than me, more qualified, more handsome. He's got a sticker on his head. Get him to do it. No, 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 you did a good job last time. We really want you to do it. And that's the trap that I fell into. 
And I'm sure a lot of people, trainers, RTO managers, owners, people who do, you know, what I'm going to call a kick-ass job, find themselves in this predicament. See you later, buddy. Now go back to your happy place. What are you closer to? Your happy place where you want to be or that dude with 8,000 laptops and a million things going through your head? Which one? You can talk, it's okay. Actually, I'm going to pick on... Is it Alicia? I'm going to pick on you. Andrew, you asked to be picked on, so this is me fulfilling your request. <laughs> you reckon you'd be the laptop guy, not the happy I'm in a waterfall guy? Yeah. Exactly, yeah, 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 you're here. Think about what it'll take to get you to this point, because I think that's really when you can set your mind at ease. You're like, hey, and, and if you love what you're doing, if you love training, if you love running a business, that's perfect. If you get the convergence of those two places, your current state and where you want to be, I think that's, that's success. That's how I'd measure it. So this is my first chapter. It's basically the organic you know, success story for me wasn't a true story of success. So then I thought, how do we fix this? So episode two is really the why. You know, the how do we fix this? And this has been actually discussed quite well um, in the preceding sessions, um, specifically by, by Lauren and, and Denise, where they talked about workplace culture and the different aspects that sort of make this happen. So I, I can expedite bits and pieces, but... And I know this is controversial to say workplace culture is a killer. Um, I'm living on the edge here. So, culture, what is it? Does anyone want to define culture for me? This is interesting. I actually thought long and hard and then I actually researched the definition of culture and I got really stuck. There isn't one true one that I loved, but anyone got any ideas of how they would define culture? Belief system. Belief system. Yeah. A set of inherent beliefs different to everyone. Yeah? You got something cool, Mick? I was going to say a set of beliefs. You can still say it, yeah. Yeah, it's still good. You still said it, yeah. So a set of beliefs, so we're getting some, some compounding effect on the beliefs, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. So expected norms of behaviour. Right. And if you think about it, those expected norms may originate from different places. From an RTO perspective, you've got your own expected norms. You've got your families, you've got your loved ones, you've got your staff, you've got the compliance people, you've got the other regulators, you've got other RTOs, you've got industry norms, you've got a whole lot of expectations that you, know, you find yourselves needing to meet. So culture isn't just a one-size-fits-all thing. And I think often that's a problem with workplace culture because whether you plan to create one or not, by default, every workplace has a culture, just like every country has a culture, just like we have created a culture here that's going to be dynamic enough to change based on the speaker and the materials we're getting. So culture, firstly, is different to everyone, and secondly, it's fluid. It changes all the time. Now... This is why things worked so well when I was doing things by myself. Because I had an empty room. I had an empty room, a blank canvas to start on. I could do what I wanted. I could make my culture of having time to myself and having a chilled out enterprise be reflected through my actions. It was super easy. You know? and, and this is why it was super easy. I'm going to do a graph just to legitimise this presentation. So you've got two axes here. Um, You've got growth. So as your business grows, we're going to go down that way. And the other one is just your standard commodity of time. So through time, things happen. For me, it was easy because I thought, look, this is me. I don't have a good picture of me, so I use that dude. Um, this is me, and this is the vision that I want for my company. This is the culture that I want to set. It's super easy because it's just me. Then what happens is as your business grows, you realise that you can't do everything yourself, correct? Well, you should realise that as early as possible. And this is my lessons learned. So you get people. But you get people that you know. You get people that you trust. You can spend time with those people to sort of advocate your cultures, your systems, your inherent beliefs, how you want things to go. This bit is seemingly easy, but you can see a bit of a divergence from the cultural establishment that I'm trying to advocate for. And, you know, people start to think for themselves. I'm not for one second saying, Laurie, that I'm right. <laughs> I'm just saying that things are different, right? and I'm, I'm regularly wrong. Right? As this expansion occurs, you get more and more people, 
and the proximity gets diluted. So these people, I had direct contact with them. It was a team of four, this is beautiful. Now you've got a team of 30, you've got a team of 100. I don't know your situation, but as it grows, naturally there's a degree of separation that grows. But often what happens is because you can't control things as much, the culture just manifests on another level. And then you get a difference between the two states. You get the difference between the state that you aim to create and the state that's naturally been created. And that, yes, that distance is often what creates the conflict of issues that we have in, in workplaces. And you, as, a, as an owner, as a founder or whatever you are, are often trying to move things back to that, whether right or wrong, because it's what you establish the brand on. This gets multiplied, especially nowadays with social media and interactions and so on. What you see is that all of this culture that was different to this gets slammed in the marketplace. Hey, look, this is what we're about. We're having casual Fridays. We're having this. We're having this. We're all focused on that. All of this stuff goes into your brand. And if you've done any branding, you know that consistency is key. And often this creates a bit of a distance between the clients you acquired using this vision and the message that's being sent out with the vision that you'd intend to create. And what you're left with is an organisation that's no longer a blank slate, there's lots of stuff happening, and this is a lot harder to control because your organisation that you've built, because it's grown so much, has actually grown and made its own culture. Things we respect, things we value, things we want to do. And that culture is now different to what we wanted to create. So you can see an, an issue there, yeah? You with me? Cool. The Pink Panther one is the best picture on that in case you're voting. So let's fix this. So this was about the why, now let's fix this. What I realised very quickly was it all came down to this, this one thing. Not a girl on a cliff, but it was all about the vision. And this has been talked about a bit in, in the sessions, but I don't think it's about talked about enough. Having a clear vision of what you want to do is one thing. And often we assume that other people will mind read what's going on inside our head. We know that's wrong. Then we need to communicate that vision. But let's start with number one. Who has a clear vision of what their business is about? Two. Two people, three people. Are you just putting up your hands to be cool? Yeah? All right. Because I'll pick on you if you've got your hand up. All right. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you two minutes to get your story straight and write down your vision for your business. If you don't have one, now's a good time to, to do it. This is the only exercise you'll do. You won't be jumping up and down or anything, but I might just point someone at random. It's on you, buddy. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you've chipped in enough. That's good. So write down your vision for your company. All right, who's got something good? That was literally two minutes. Anyone? In the red. Okay, so it sounds a bit corny. Good. But... But basically what mm. our business is about is mm. helping RTOs improve their own culture of compliance in a nutshell. Good. So you're standing off that cliff and hopefully not too close to the edge, but what you're seeing is you're seeing all these RTOs out there with an improved culture of compliance. That's clear. For me, that's, that's really clear. That's a great vision because you can actually see that happening. Anyone else? Anyone else got a vision they want to share? Yes, this table's winning. I should have got prizes. Yes. Okay, so you went back to your happy place. And you went, hey, I'll sort of exonerate myself from my business and I'll be commercially sound. I can travel. Perfect. That's your vision. You probably are this person on holiday. I don't know where this photo was taken. There's some snow there. Hopefully you like snow. So that's, that's good. This is a good vision. So if you don't have a vision, if it's not clear, how do you know where you're going to end up? And, you know... I guess Lauren said before, your, your pleasure and your pain direct your, your way or, or something to that. Um, I was semi-paying attention. <laughs> but if you don't have a clear vision, it's just going to be di directed by other forces. You're going to get pulled in different directions. So if you don't live out your dreams, you're going to live out someone else's dreams. Have that clear vision, step one. Then we talk about mission and difference in a vision and a mission. A vision is basically what you see, what we talked about. The mission is basically how you're going to get there. And for me, if you think about this journey to get to that, where that girl is over there, 
we've got some obstacles, we've got a way to go, and, and that's our mission. It's like a computer game. Along the way, we'll get challenges. We'll get some challenges that's going to make things a little bit hard, but not impossible. Now, what I want you to do is identify two or three of those challenges, because you're going to take this stuff back to your workplaces, and you're going to workshop with your staff. You're going to say, look, this is our vision. We're going to help RTOs be compliant. We're going to Maybe just reword that one. But as a business, we're going to be sustainable and we're going to grow to the point that I'm not needed anymore. Um, okay, good. You've got your vision. Now work back and say, what are two or three key things that are impeding my ability to get there already? Time, resources, challenges, whatever they are. Just try and be as specific as possible because they're going to be the challenges. And I find that sometimes you've got this so far out vision and, and it's great, but you just think, oh, it's too hard. When you start breaking down the too hard into manageable things, it seems achievable. So some people are still writing, so I'll let you keep going for a while. Big pens. <laughs> I'm going to pick someone at random. I feel bad picking. I'll pick you at random because you look like you're, you're pretty onto it. What have you got? What's your biggest challenge at the moment? Stopping you to get to your point. Um, time, knowledge, desire, Derek, and money. Derek? <laughs> Was Derek one of them? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, husbands are challenging. I, I can attest to this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what you need to do is, is have this rational argument and say, look, I've defined the vision and you're a challenge, so I need to get around this challenge. So I need to remove the challenge, remove the roadblock. So here's a game of footy. You just watch that and let me do what I'm doing. Yeah? <laughs> that would work with me. Yeah. <laughs> here's a ticket, go surfing, that would work. So if you start looking at your challenges, you can say, well, hang on, th apart from the husband, I don't know, they may not that be that big. You may be able to conquer them. Did anyone get any challenges that they thought there's no way we can achieve this? No. But often that's our mindset. Things are so far away, it's too hard. So go back to work and put some stepping stones. Yearly, quarterly, daily, whatever it is, just put some markers that you say, all right, tick that off, tick that off, tick that off, and I'm halfway through the mountain and I'm there. The other important thing I've found is to get people on the same page from a values perspective. And this is super important. If nothing else, make sure that your organisation's values are aligned. Now, again, I'm going to give you a few seconds because I want you to write some things down, mainly to take back to the workplace. What do you think your current values are in your organisation? Integrity. I just made that one up because it sounds cool, but what do you think your, your values are? I'm not trying to fill your head up with suggestive powers. And are they your values or your staff's values as well? Is it the company's values? I'm just making sure that you've got an original thought, you're not stealing my mates again. Yeah, that's, that's what's happening. <laughs> you keep looking at him, it's like it's not a test. <laughs> Thinking, yeah. I hear there's some students a lot, like you start going near them, like, I'm thinking, I'm doing my work. It's, it's, it's not assessed, guys. It's not... You've got something. It's... Well, you should. Sora. Okay, Sora. <laughs> yeah, that was all the stretching. It's good for you. <laughs> Does anyone want to share their values? Yes. Sorry, we'll go. Tell it like it is. Yeah, so no BS. Perfect. Great value. And is that one of your personal values or embodied through your organisation? Sorry? Company Company's values. Perfect. Tell it like it is. Yeah. So I don't have company values, but we will share a pride and values, so respect, integrity, success and empowerment. Perfect. And is, in your contention, is that being reflected in the organisation? Very effective. Perfect. Because where you get the biggest issues is where your values don't reflect your actions. And I think that's what makes that state of disharmony that we've been talking about in the other presentations, where we say, look, we value this. We value our students. 
You know, we value doing the right thing. And then our actions are kind of different to that. That's what creates that cognitive dissonance. And that's what gets people offside. Because people sign up because of values. Right? And if people have got different compasses pointing in different directions, there's no way you can guide them towards that vision. Right? So you need to make sure you get people with the same moral compass, the same inherent values as, as you. There's a bit of a lag here. It's like being on Skype. <coughs> All right. At this point, I normally do a reality check. And um, this is like the ye yellow Mazda scenario that, that Laurie talked about. And the scientific, I guess, basket to throw that in is actually a cognitive bias called affirmation bias. So what you tend to do is you tend to seek things to affirm what you believe. Right? So you've set your vision, you've set your values, you've set all this stuff, and then you go around your organisation and, and you keep trying to prove, yes, we're doing the right thing. Yes, our values are being reflected. Yes, our staff are doing the right thing. Right? But let's play a game very quickly. It's a maths game. I know it's late in the afternoon. I try not to do maths in the afternoon. Um, Here's a, um, here's a test for the Brainiacs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to answer yes or no, and the ultimate aim of this is I want you to guess my sequence. All right? Maths kids have probably worked out already, but whatever. You're going to tell me a number that you think fits my sequence, and I'm going to say yes or no, and at the end you're going to try and guess what my pattern was. Anyone want to start with the next number? Whoa, 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 one. What do you got? 16. Yes, that meets my sequence. You're nodding as well. Anyone else want to suggest another number that might meet my sequence? Two. No, that does not meet my sequence. 32. Yes, that meets my sequence. 64. That meets my sequence. 128 meets my sequence. All right, you've got my sequence? Are you sure? Can you give me a guarantee that you can get my sequence? No, you can't. All right. Anyone balls enough to say, yes, I can? You've got to believe in yourself here. I'm going to shut you down, but you've got to believe in yourself. Anyone want to tell me what my sequence was? No, not Fibonacci? Yeah, well, Fibonacci is like, you know, 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 5 is 8, 8 plus 5 is 13, 21, and so on. Doubled? Who's going with doubled? Yeah, okay. What about the rest of you? You're unsure. Sorry? Squared? Okay. Well, one would be there, two wouldn't, eight wouldn't, you'd have nine. Yeah. What we tend to do is we tend to go, I know what comes next. And what comes next in our mind is, is 16. We go, cool, yeah, that makes sense. And we're doubling that, and then we double that one, double that one, 16 comes next. That, that's what you had, right, in your heart of hearts? What we tend not to do, because you could have asked as many yes or no questions as possible, what we tend to do is ask questions or we look for things that reinforces that sequence. So we had, you know, your 16s, 32, 64, 128, 256, 502, 12, good. Your maths is better than mine right now. And you keep going. You keep seeking to reinforce that. But what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? The key in this test is to ask questions that you know is going to be wrong. So two was a great question. I thought that's going down the line because... You're seeking to disprove your original thought. My sequence of people was just ascending numbers. So if you said 9, 10, 11, 12, I'd gone cool. If you said any number bigger than 8, I'd say, yeah, that's an ascending number. So you see, sometimes we don't see the reality, but we see our version of the reality. And the more we construct it, the more we intend to validate it, the more down that rabbit hole we get. That's the same with culture. We look for things that reinforce our culture. We look for the yellow Mazda 3s. Look for the BMWs on the road. Okay. Put another test on there. This one's a good one. What if I told you that the shading of squares A and B were the same? Would you believe me? I actually downloaded from, this in from the internet and I didn't believe initially. So you'd say this was grey and you'd say this was white or would you say that's the same? Who would say they're the same? Because they are the same. Sorry? So you're saying they're the same? Yes. Yeah. Anyone saying... Are you talking about the squares? Yeah, the squares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this colour and this colour, same or different? It's a different grey, it's, but it's still grey? Yeah, but it's a different shade? Yeah. 
Yes, some people are saying it's white. Ooh, <laughs> 50. Some people are saying it's white. What if I told you they were, in fact, the same shade, the same colour? You wouldn't believe me, right? You just... No. What if I proved it to you? What if I started covering... And this is called contextual interpretation because what our brain does, it uses other things to trick ourselves into believing things that we know are wrong. Ten minutes left. Jeez, this guy's harsh. So what I'm going to do is prove to you they're exactly the same sh shade. There's no magic here. I'm just inserting shapes like in on PowerPoint just to cover off the rest. And you can see as I insert shapes, they start to be the same colour. It's pretty freaky, hey? It messed with my brain. The worst thing is, once you take that stuff away, same colour, right? Yeah. Once you start taking that stuff away, it goes back to being that other version. It's totally trip it. Google it and you can see for yourself, but it's, it's actually a fact. So what we tend to do is we tend to surround ourselves with things that make us believe a certain thing to the point where our brains get totally tricked. Interesting. So closing off episode three, this is about trying to make more of yourself to make things happen. And this is a practical side of things. As a business owner, you know that you can't make more of you. And as my learned colleague here said, you want to remove yourself from doing a lot of the things that you're doing. I'm not going to say just, you know, handball things to people and, and so on, but what it came down to was to try and have some efficient systems. Policies, processes, all that sort of stuff are, are great, but often the focus is different. Think about the vision that you just said. Was the vision to be compliant? No. You, you want to make other people compliant. So your processes, your policies, all your systems should be geared towards delivering that vision, your vision, not someone else's vision which often in this sector, we're getting pulled from different masters. We're, meeting our, we're making our systems meet other people's visions. And once the system's in there, it's hard to change. And inherently, we all have systems, whether we design them or not. So you've all got a system for tying your laces. You've all got a system for getting out of bed in the morning. And you operate with those systems. So the key here was, for me, I thought, I need to have a system that everyone can operate at, and that system to converge towards giving us the vision that we want as an organisation to get everyone on the same page. This just makes me super hungry. Um, who does this well? McDonald's. Who does this well? All those big companies. And if you look at the success of those companies, it's their systems. It's not their people. It's, not their, it's definitely not their product. It's their systems. So if you go buy a Macca's franchise or a Subway or any of those things, what do they sell you? Their systems. That's all they sell you. Right. So if your RTO has great systems, it's worth something. If your RTO doesn't have great systems, it's worth you. That's it. That's where the value is. It's, it's you because you're running the whole thing through your brain. If you can convert it to systems, you get closer to this sort of model. We'll see if this works for sound. No sound, we can skip it. But you get the idea, right? These guys are making burgers. It's an orchestrated thing. I'll do the voiceover. And their goal was to make burgers in 30 seconds versus 30 minutes. When you think about your systems, can we achieve that? Can we get our experience refined to the point where we can deliver what we want? And once we have that system, can we then communicate to other people? Yes, IP theft, I took this from the founder, but, you know, it's, it's OK. It's actually a good movie. What they um, also established, these guys, was... And we did this activity at work, and it was the most valuable thing we've ever done. We mapped out all of our systems. We talked, Denise, where are you, wherever, somewhere, talked about touch points with students. We mapped out every single interaction point, like these guys did on the, on the court. And we sought to see how can we best manage this? Because we have a small team, but we have a lot of clients. And for us, it was a measure of being efficient, but still delivering that quality and that standard we want. Because if you design systems to a high grade, you can have great outcomes. If you don't design your own systems, you're going to end up doing whatever. So that's my challenge for you. Go back to the workplace and start making some, some pretty good systems. This is a system. I'm getting told when to finish. Without that, I have chaos. I'd just keep going. I'd get it. The next person would get angry. You'd miss on afternoon tea. So the system here is, is saving us. It's my job to follow the system. And sometimes that's the break point. But I find through collaboration, if you 
do what we did, we get the whole team together to define the systems, people will follow them. If you tell them, hey, we're doing this, it's not really going to be a suite. So for us, we said, let's start with stuff that's not working. Because you don't want to do this massive undertaking. You want to start with the small stuff. Prioritise. Find a system in your organisation that's giving you errors. Right? If you've got some stats, even better. Things that you're getting complaints about, things that's taking up your time, all of that sort of stuff, that's your priority. The next consideration. What are some things that I can design that I can get myself out of my business? What are some things that don't need my special skill set? Or what are some things I can train my staff to do? Because the whole point of this is to empower and motivate people. So what are some things that I can put to get people to that level? Also, if it's a one-off endeavour, you don't really get the economies of scale here. So let's start focusing on some things that we regularly repeat. For me, even as a, as a consultant, I got responding to emails down to an art, down to a system. It created a lot of back-end work where I'd make a lot of videos, a lot of content. But then when I got an email from a student, I was like, oh, crap, I have to answer this again. I was like, awesome, I get to share this link to this video that I've invested all this time with, and it became a totally different mindset. Right. So the system actually saved me. So things that we do organically. I mean, we went down to even, this is how we started it. We said, all right, to the team, let's try and make a system for making a cup of tea. And then we worked out that everyone had a different version of this system. So we took our most basic system at work and we realised that everyone had a different way of doing it. So then we said, OK, well, let's take best practice. What's so good about that aspect? What's so good about that aspect? And we started making all these hybrid systems with the combined intelligence of our staff because I wasn't right. They had better ideas. They are at the coalface. They're dealing with customers all the time. They're the ones you need to get involved in this process. The more we got into it, the more we found this is actually a, a pretense of systems theory, the more interconnection they were. So then we isolate all the systems. We made sure the systems, systems worked, but then we looked at the interaction between the systems. How can we fix all of this stuff? This made me be able to come here and talk to you. I've got people running the courses. This is awesome. I can actually have the free time to do the things I want. Before this re revelation, I would have been not here. I would have been running courses, super busy, doing all these crazy things, back to the version that I didn't want to be. So I'm a testament to know that this works. I learned this the hard way. Start with a system for making systems. That's your first system. When you go back to the workplace, just make a system on how you're going to make these systems. Define what that system's going to do. Define when it's going to kick in. So when a student rolls, when we get a phone call, what's going to trigger that system? Who's going to be involved in it? And this is super simple. And then define how it's going to happen. And I'm not talking about bundles of paperwork. Most of our systems at work aren't this. They're more this stuff where we've just gone through and used a simple video and said, OK, well, this is how we do this. We've used screenshots of computer programs so someone can go through, totally new person, this is how I enrol a, pro a, a student. The next level, which we're on now, is really automating all these systems. So trying to take the human element out because we've got variability and trying to take a robot that we can program in. So. The key and, and, the, and the hard thing is not to lose that individual touch. All right? So the stuff that's generic, make systems for. The stuff that you want to contextualise and individualise, don't make a system that's so rigid for that. Give people that, that thought ability and that ability to, to customise it. The one, number one rule with our systems is that people can collaborate. If people think there's a better way of doing it, that gets discussed. That gets logged on the issues and we discuss a better way of doing it. So I said our culture changes, our systems change. And your systems have to have that dynamic ability to change. Otherwise, they're going to be outdated, they're not going to work, they're going to be the policies and procedures you drafted to start your ITO that you never look at again. All right? So this is the stuff that you want to try and ingrain. Setting a culture that starts with a system and a system that's directed towards that vision. I know it's been quite a pretty hardcore presentation about systems and so on, but it's not as sexy as the stuff I normally talk about, but this stuff actually worked, and it's, it saves lives. Systems save lives. I'm going to go with that. Good bumper sticker. Totally made that up. Life is full of systems. You just have to learn where to look, and then you have to learn how to improve those systems. I'll leave you with a little story before I get actually booted off. When I was young, I worked out how to break systems, right? and this comes back to my story of surfing. I worked out that the school I went to, you went in and you signed up. You said, yep, I'm here. Then you went off to your respective class at high school. 
then you came back at the end day to sign in. So I thought, the two points I need to actually be at school start in the end. So what happened in the middle? I went surfing, right? So once you understand the system, you can then break the system. I'm not telling you to be evil here. Use this for, for, for the good rather than the evil. Um, that story backfired because we ended up getting caught because someone didn't understand the system and we all got implicated. Um, but the best thing is we then got suspended as a result of that, which gave us more time off school so we could go surfing. <laughs> so then we did it again and the, we just got, this is an awesome system. Like, we get caught for not being at school, for going surfing. They reward us, punish, by sending us back to have more time off school. This is why I'm not the most exceptional academic, um, but, yeah, straight smarts, straight smarts. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.